The governors make up some of the most challenging warlords that Total War Three Kingdoms has to offer. Each one of these warlords is placed in a rather dangerous starting area with very few friends and even more enemies. The enterprising Kong Rong and his trade monopolies make up the easternmost edge of the map. Liu Biao and his starting vassals, as well as student, scholar, and tutor court positions start smack dab in the middle with probably the fastest access to Liu Bu in the game next to Zhang Zhuo, of course. And lastly, Ma Tung, the protector of the West, is, well, far to the West, with the easiest access to horse pastures. In today's video, we're going to talk about all three of these warlords, how to get a better foothold in their campaigns, as well as some tricks for each one. I know a lot of you wanted me to discuss Kong Rong's trade monopoly currency, so this is me jumping into that. So we're going to just kind of go from left to right on these guys, talk about Kong Rong first and close with Ma Tung. Let's jump on in, guys. So here we are with Kong Rong. Now, Kong Rong's mechanics are, of course, focused on his trade monopoly unique resource. And it isn't so much a unique resource in that you spend it in the typical way you would other factions. It's why I actually kind of skipped it in the um, Warlord Currencies video that we did. But we're going to talk about that nonetheless here today. So his specialization is on the trade monopoly as well as population. And the higher his population, the more trade influence he gets. And if you don't know what trade influence does, we'll go over it in a little second here when we jump into the diplomacy screen. But he gets two unique crossbowmen, the Fury of Beihai and then the Thunderer of Jian'an. In addition to that, he gets the Academies of Culture. He gets an education program, which is a, a special assignment for him, which increases his commerce or his income from commerce. And he has a loyalty to the Han. So he cannot declare as emperor by creating an emperor's seat. Uh, can become emperor by capturing the capital of an existing emperor. And I'll be totally honest with you, when it comes to the governors as a whole, it's typically a little bit harder to do the whole emperor victory condition. They're kind of meant to play more heavily into um, commerce or, or economy or treasury for that matter. And if you want a really good example of a great Kong Rong playthrough right now, uh, Party Elite is doing one on his channel and I've actually asked him directly for some tips on this. So you'll see a, a card pop up in the upper right hand corner, at least you should, I should be able to link to another person's channel. But if you want to see a Kong Rong playthrough, he's he's going, rather than making a wide empire, he's going tall, trying to have a smaller location that is very, very well built up. So if you want to have a good playthrough there, uh, you can go check it out on his channel. But a lot of the tips actually come from the man himself. So this is turn one of a Kong Rong campaign. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do the typical situation. We'll do this. We'll delegate it. And then we'll expand out to the uh, the adjoining town right next to it. Um, as always, guys, I definitely don't recommend you delegate these initial battles. Um, only delegate if you are so, so far ahead in the balance of power that you know you will win. So we'll go over here and then we'll take this livestock farm and just kind of be done with this. This will help me kind of exemplify how to best progress with Kong Rong because he has a very special starting location in that he starts right next to Liu Bei, but also Yuan Chuao, which is going to be your primary enemy of your campaign. Yes, yes, I know. Let's take a look here. Now that we've kind of got a little bit better of a situation, short by a dip. So we can see that Kong Rong is right here, where Bei Hai is. And then we to the east, we have uh, Dong Lai and then Long Yi. Now, Long Yi will be captured by Liu Bei pretty quickly. Liu Bei, is, Liu Bei starts right here. So he will take the, uh, the Iron Mine of Dong <laughs> and then expand southeast to Long Yi. So you have a lot of options as Kong Rong. You can immediately expand to Taishan, putting you right next to Yuan Shuao. And I wouldn't really recommend this unless you're really ready to deal with that level of aggression that early in the game. Um, what I would actually recommend is one of two options. One, you can come down here to Long Yi and take it immediately. If you do, then Liu Bei cannot expand northeast into this portion of the peninsula. Um, Liu Bei does have his unity resource, which allows him to annex any of the Han Empire. Now, by taking Long Yi here, Liu Bei then cannot leapfrog you and go into these regions. He will not trespass willingly. In fact, I'll show you how we can really cement the fact that he won't trespass. And the only way he would expand out here would be to uh, use a boat. And that's probably very unlikely. So 
Um, before we jump our turn and go further into some more details with Kong Rong, I want to go over his actual character sheet. We hover over this, we can see that he gives a nice increase to the population growth, which plays into his mechanic wherein population growth or population increases his trade influence. In addition, he gets a nice plus one to his resilience and then a 50% trade influence bonus. Now, the way trade influence works is, you can see that right here, uh, our current trade influence is 117. Now, the higher our trade influence, the more money we make from trade agreements. And those and those uh, trade that trade influence can be influenced heavily by trade monopoly. You can see the very first stage is stagnant all the way up to whoop, there we go, dominating. Now, this is a reduction to the trade monopoly. It kind of uh, creates uh, tension in the market. And it's basically like the decay of his um, resource, as it were. But you get a 100% increase to your trade influence. And then when we take a look at uh, his unique building line, Academies of Culture, and we hover over the, the top two, Grand Public Academy allows him to have a, la a large public growth, public order, and then income from all sources, which is pretty nice. But Grand Academy of Poetry gets you again that public order, gets you some nice population growth. You get a, a, a lower population growth, but you get a higher income from culture. Well, you get income from culture, period. In my opinion, I would say the Grand Public Academy is a little bit better because it plays into a lot more mechanics for Kong Rong, um, especially population growth and income from all sources. Um, we'll, and I'll talk about peasantry income as we go through uh, how to build out his commanderies. But we're going to go ahead and end, yeah, end this turn so we can go into some diplomacy options here and show you how Trade Monopoly really works. Because as you progress through this campaign with Kong Rong, you'll get a lot of trade agreements coming your way from the AI. Kong Rong starts with three trade agreement options right out the gate. Um, go to diplomacy here and you can see he's got three trade partner options. Some people start with one, some with two, some with zero. He, I think, is the only one who starts with three. So Liu Bei has taken over those mines, like I said he would, at Dong. So we're going to click Liu Bei. We're going to negotiate, trade and marriage. You'll see you've got two options here. Trade agreement is just your standard edition trade agreement. And you can see from the text, it's only going to add one line when I hover up. Boop. Negotiate a trade agreement with this faction, which will increase your trade monopoly. That's the key phrase there. Every time you're going to get a trade agreement from an AI faction during their turn, it's going to be an offer for a trade agreement, not a monopoly. So it is up to you, the player, that when you are offered this by the AI, you press negotiate and you, you, change the, you change the offer from an agreement to a monopoly. It should go through just fine, but if you don't, you will not gain the benefit of the trade monopoly resource of Kong Rong here this is what we're going to gain we're going to gain iron and we're going to get 336 uh copper gold per turn boom there we go so now that we have that signed it is also it is pretty much going to cement us taking long yi as a way to stop liu bei's expansion he's not again like i said liu bei's faction um mission is to protect you and tao chan right or not tao chan um there's a there's a faction right here and I can't remember um, who it is. It might, might actually be Taochian. I can't remember again. But still, he's right here and his mission is to protect both of you. So if you do this, Liu Bei is very much unlikely to expand to these northeast portions. And once you cement this area, the whole peninsula is going to create so much income from you for you. So taking a look at where the high starts, um, my very first order here would be, in fact, I probably should have done this on turn one, is go to assignments, go to uh, Sun Chuao, and I would assign supervised construction. The reason you're doing this on turn one is you don't really want to build anything on turn one, or if you do, you want to build something that only takes a turn to build, and this thing is not going to benefit it, right? So we're going to assign this, and we'll even do this this turn. Let's just go ahead and, and I'll, I'll explain why we're doing this. We're going to build a government support building which is going to increase our income from peasantry. So next turn, sorry, uh, next turn, we can then build a large town, which rather than taking four turns, it will take three turns. So that's the primary focus there. 
Now, we want to stack a lot of peasantry income with Kongrong because you start with Beihai, which has got a livestock farm attached to it. Now, the lumber yard, the fishing port, and the farmland uh, are your next income sources. Two of the three of those are going to be from peasantry. Your fishing port will, of course, be commerce. So this really begs the question, how do you go with the reform or reforms for, I always say reform, with the reforms for Kong Rong? Well, you obviously start with foreign envoys, which gives you access to upper level fishing ports. You kind of have that um, cemented. You can then go to Sino-Roman embassies and get you again, get you again, them, them grand fishing ports. But you're also going to want to go with stuff like this. It you access gets it gets you access to um, the upgraded version of your timber or your your lumber yards. You can get more peasantry income from them. So really, kind of dipping into both the population, which is the green line, and then the commerce portion, which is this blue portion, um, is going to maximize the amount of income you're generating from your single commerce building and your primary peasantry buildings. So to really maximize that, you want to get a um, government support building because this will increase your income from peasantry by 100% at the top level. Um, and you want to focus in the fishing port, maximizing that as fast as you can. You will run into an issue with not being able to cement Longyi because you've got Liu Bei there, but that's okay. If you have Dong Lai, you'll have two nice commanderies right next to each other and then eventually expanding to Taishan once you've taken this portion of the peninsula, should set you up for a very good, strong uh, mid to late game adventure with Kong Rong. Um, going through some of the techniques, or I'm sorry, not the techniques, some of the tips from uh, uh, Party Elite, he was saying pretty much that Taishan and Dong Lai will really give you a lot of great financial hubs for a lot of early game income. And that is really going to be your, your focus there, right? Is once you have all this income cemented, your war against Yuan Shua over here will be a lot easier for you. Because if you take a look at Trade Monopoly, every army reduces faction-wide trade influence by 35%. So you do not want a lot of armies with Kong Rong. Maybe two at max. I mean, that's even then, that's pretty dicey. So we have one single army out. That's a minus 35% to our trade influence right now. So you do have to balance that kind of fine edge when you're dealing with Kong Rong. But hopefully this gives you a lot of really great tips on how to play him. Um, you have a lot of routes of expansion, but to be totally honest with you, I would hold this peninsula and then at, with your war with Yuan Shuao, I would just kind of push into his territory as see fit. Uh, let Liu Bei expand to where he expands and kind of keep him as a close ally. And I would definitely shut down uh, Huang Chuao as fast as you can as well because... It's not going to be anyone's friend, and getting rid of him is only going to bolster your diplomacy with other factions. But hopefully this gives you a really good idea of how to play Kong Rong. Actually, before we move on, there's something I did forget to talk about, and I did say I would talk about, are the crossbowmen. So when you take a look over here at Recruit, I'm going to open up the panel for the Fury of Beihai. Now, I've got the toggle comparison. Hold on. A pain in the ass that right-click them. Toggle comparison activated right now. Um, these are your standard edition crossbowmen. These are your special ones that you get as uh, Kong Rong. Uh, he, of course, is a strategist, so he gets access to stuff like trebuchets and uh, special archers. Now, hovering over these guys, the normal crossbowmen, you can see, if I look at this, our, uh, yeah, a ranged attack rate is 12. If you hover over, you can see that it is better than normal crossbowmen, which have a range attack rate of 7. So this is the nice thing about the uh, Fury of Beihai is that they have a high damage, high AP, or armor-piercing value, um, just like light crossbow, crossbowmen would have. But, in addition to that, they have the same firing rate of archers. You can take a look here, that 12 and 12 is the exact same. They even have a better ammunition reserve uh, by comparison to archers. So that's the kind of the nice caveat that you get with the Fury of Beihai, in addition that you get uh, a higher ammunition, the same firing rate of normal archers with bows, but with more damage and ranged uh, armor piercing damage. But I wanted to cover that on a uh, last thing real quick before we jump over to our next war next warlord. Now our next warlord, Liu Biao, does not have per se a unique currency, but he does have some unique court mechanics that do make for, again, a very unique uh, playstyle. Uh, his focus is of course on harmony and knowledge. Court tutors increase character experience gain. 
He does have two nice, uh, unique infantry units, infantry of Jing and then Imperial Defenders. These guys are pole arm, pole arm infantry. He also has his lodgings building line. He has court scholars, which is a special position we'll go into in just a little bit. And then loyalty to the Han yet again. Again, this is my whole emphasis on going for the emperor title with the governors is typically not the best call. I would just kind of uh, segue that into a different approach for your campaign. Let's take a look at the uh, the starting location for Liu Biao itself. Now, like I said, it is smack... I always like to switch this ownership. It's smack dab in the middle of everything. Dong Zhuo is up here. Yuan Shu is right here. Hong Yi is right there. Um, you have two vassals in Sai Mao and uh, Huang Zhu. Then you've got uh, any, a bunch of Han Empire all, all throughout here. Now, Sun Jian starts right... It doesn't show him on the map, but he's right there. Um, he does not, he has this, the beginning of this commandery of Changsha right there as well. And we'll talk about why that's important in just a second. So, what are we going to do? The typical kind of scenario, we'll do this. I will delegate it because I, even though I say not to delegate, I, I'm just going to do that for the sake of this video. Fruit. Yes, yes, yes. And then do the standard edition push to Jiang Yang. Now, there is an alternative route you could take, and I wouldn't overly recommend it unless you're a little bit more advanced into the game and you're willing to deal with all the issues that come with it. But you've got the Nanyang Jade Mine right here, and I don't think you can actually even do it, to be totally honest, but if you can capture this and get into an immediate war with Yuan Shu, uh, because he, he starts right there, his first turn will be to do the exact same thing we did, with this being his first starter town. Um, but the Jade Mines are extremely important. Extremely important. And the reason behind that is, we take a look at Lodging, his unique building line. It increases income from commerce. Also, the, uh, well, income from, it gives income from commerce and then increases in commerce. And as well, you've got the Gentleman Tea Garden, which will increase that income from commerce a small reduction to the percentage increase income from commerce, but you get a 15% character experience gain. So the nice thing about Liu Biao is that you can really steamroll big bad characters quickly because of this in conjunction with his uh, court positions, which we'll go into in just a second. Um, now why I'm saying Jade Mines are so important is that they're some of the only ways to get access to commerce in the early portions of Liu Biao's campaign. This is one of the only other Jade Mines in the game. The second one, I think, is just around here. I think it's like right... Yeah, it's right here. This is a Jade Mine. There's only two Jade Mines on the entire map. And why Jade, Why I'm saying Jade Mine is if I go to Reforms, I go to... Where is it? This one, I think. Yes. This will show us what the level 5 Jade Mine will be like. So a level 5 Jade Mine will give us income from Commerce and industry. Almost all mines are exclusively industry. As you can see here, copper mining, iron craftsman is industry. This is the only mine that gives us commerce as well. The only other means of gaining commerce are from trade ports. And the closest trade port at this point in the game is around, oh man, um, well, you've got this one at Changsha right here, of course. And then you've got another trade port way to the north right there. Um, in Anding and Dong Zhuo's territory. So the only other trade ports outside of this that are, are even relatively close are like down over here. Uh, there's actually like two trade ports on these uh, on this portion of the river. So it's really hard to take advantage of that commerce gain from lodging if you don't make the buildings that will help increase your commerce. So you can make the lodging building line, which will give you raw commerce income. Um, schools do not give you commerce income, obviously. Then the marketplace will increase your commerce income again. So this is me saying that the lodging line is really, really <clears throat> cool and gives a lot of great options for um, Liu Biao, but he just doesn't have a lot of access to commerce building or income from commerce. So this is one of the only ways to get an early access to it. But let's touch on another subject, of course, the court. So going into the court, we can see that there is the student, scholar, and tutor positions of Liu Biao's court. And if we click this button and hover over uh, Liu Qi, we can see that this will give him 25% character experience gain. So this is a really great way to level up characters 
fast. Like especially if you get a uh, legendary character in your candidate pool and you want to get up and running quickly, this is a real great way to get that character up to speed quite fast. Now, Liu, Bie de, Liu Biao uh, does present himself a lot of interesting scenarios in his starting location. Um, I find that vassals are not particularly useful. In fact, I find them very, very dangerous because they can pull you into a lot of unwanted wars. So I use my vassals as kind of cash cows, and that's really the way I think they're supposed to be used. Um, Sai Mao, I pretty much won't do anything with, but Guangzhou does start with a farmland, and you can see we have a lot of food issues with Liu Biao. So you can leverage this in the diplomacy screen that I'll show you guys on our next turn. Now, you've got a lot of options for expansion with Liu Biao as well. So you can go south into what is all Han territory, and this is probably one of the safer routes you can do. If you move south, you don't really have much opposition aside from Han. Um, it does kind of get a little boring because you're just fighting a bunch of Han territories. Um, you can move west into Dong Zhuo and eventually actually fight him. If you do that, you'll end up with a lot of positive diplomatic relations with the rest of the entire portion of the game. Uh, Cao Cao, Yuan Shu, Yuan Shuao, they'll all like, like you a lot more because as soon as Dong Zhuo's nation dissolves, you've pretty much uh, already kind of gotten their buy-in from all of what you're doing. Um, it does kind of limit your expansion because you're going to be dealing with a lot of eastern expansion as well, gobbling up Dong Zhuo's territory. So... This might be the safest route, but the slowest. This will be a safer route, but a, I think a good speed. Now, a harder route, um, but with a lot of reward, is blitzing over here to Changsha's trade port. This will be a focus for Sun Jian very quickly. Very, very quickly. So if you can beat him to this and get in a war with Sun Jian immediately and actually knock him out as an, adver an adversary at the very beginning, you won't deal with the late game power menace that is Sun Jian. He gets so strong towards that late game. This is a really great way of shutting it down, uh, getting you access to an early commerce building, and at the same time, kind of cementing your territory. You're going to deal with nothing but Han over here for the most part. So you'll be in a real good position to be removed from a lot of the major conflicts and build up your power base to then expand north, west, south, east, however you want to go. Um, just be, like I said, be wary that this has a chance of backfiring you on you and creating a very prolonged fight. One thing I did talk about in the very beginning of this video, though, is the possibility of acquiring Lu Bu very quickly. Now, what I'm about to show you is not something I would recommend for a beginning player wanting to play Liu Biao, it is going to put a lot of stress for you, on you to really deal with the relationship issues that Liu Bu will bring to the table. But, what the hell, let's, so, let's show some fun stuff. So we're going to go to our court, go to our family tree, go to Lady Sai, left click her, and then we're going to press divorce. Confirm. So we're going to wait a turn now. And what we're going to do is, we're going to demand the marriage of Lady Sai to Dong Zhuo's faction heir, which is, of course, Lu Bu. And we're going to get access to Lu Bu right quick like. So we'll click um, Diplomacy. Then we'll go to Dong Zhuo, who is already firm friends with us. Negotiate. Now you go to Trade and Marriage. Do not press Offer Marriage. I did that the first time testing this, and I was like, what the fuck, I didn't even get Lu Bu. You want to press Receive Marriage. Boop, and boop. It will not be a favorable situation. Um, what you're going to do, though, is go back to Trade, go to Trade Ancillaries, and just, I'm going to put everyone into this that I can. Whatever, whatever it takes to kind of make it happen. I might actually not have enough Ancillaries in this situation. Ooh, we don't. We'll just make a payment here. Um, we'll increase this to 200. Oop, nope, not 2,200. All right. You drive a hard bargain, Dong Zhuo. 300. Bitch. 400. My final offer. My god, man. There we go. So, this will work. Deal is signed. 
we'll go back here and you can see marriage lady sai and lu bu uh proposer lady sai recipient lu bu recipient faction lu biao so we'll go back to our court and we can see lu bu is in our court now you can see from this picture he is pissed off so you have to really mitigate his massive desire for a higher court position i mean he's having a tantrum already that he's not the faction heir um if you're doing this situation, I would recommend immediately making him a student. Bring up your faction panel on him. And then increase, promote him a couple times. As you can see, satisfaction plus 10, Lubu, duration 10 turns. I promoted him twice. That should kind of hold him over for a little bit. We have plenty of starting money to do that, so it's good. Um, another thing here is I said I would talk about how to pretty much exploit your vassals. We'll do that real quick as well. And this I'd recommend regardless of what you do with Lu Bu. So we're going to click uh, Huang Zhe and we can see that, or Zhu, we can see that he's got three food income coming in. We're going to click negotiate on him. We're going to go to trade and marriage. We're going to request food trade because we need three as we can see. And you know what? I'm going to offer a guarantee. Oh, no, 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 no. No, okay. offer a guarantee of autonomy. So what this does is you're telling him, hey, I'm never going to annex you, man. Don't worry about it. You're good here. You do whatever you want. Because honestly, I have no interest in annexing them. If you annex them, um, it's a massive hit to your trustworthiness. It makes you actually treacherous. I'll show you what that looks like on Sai Mao. Then, you know what? To cut, we've got plus 58. We might as well do uh, request regular payments from them. You can probably type in... Uh, they can't actually can't request a whole ton here, but we'll type in, say, 200. Oh, no. They're very poor. Even less. Yeah, we can barely... There. I mean, you might as well get some money for it if you can't. So, this shows us that we're now going to get three food from them for 10 turns... Uh, we're going to just say, hey, yeah, we'll guarantee you autonomy, and you're going to give us a little bit of money. Propose deal, boom, done, over with. Now, if I look at Sai Mao, um, like I was saying, if I pressed Annex on them, I will immediately take over this territory, which can be good in some situations, but look. You can see it immediately has a negative effect on both of my vassals, and the game will actually stop you saying, hey, whoa, ho, ho, that's pretty treacherous, my dude. So... So I would not go about that. I know they can pull you into a lot of conflicts, but I mean, even he has got enough food where I could request food from him as well. So use these guys as a means of driving up your income. You hover over this, your treasury. You can see that tributaries, those are anyone who is a delivering tribute to you if you're an outlaw or if you're a vassal. Um, so a vassal, I'm getting portion of their their tax income i'm getting 275 from them this is only turn two but that will increase as they stay my vassals so again just use them as a source of income use them as a source of food because they do have access to those resources but for the most part this should really give you a really good idea of how to play liu biao um he is a very difficult governor in my opinion i think kong rong has a little bit easier of a starting position even ma tung is a little bit easier than uh, liu biao liu biao is stuck between a lot of, a rock, a rock and a hard place, quite literally. Um, one thing to be mindful of uh, for closing this portion of the video out with Lu Bu is that, yeah, he's great. He's in your army, right? He cost 8,000 to field. So you really, and he cost 460 with a massive upkeep. So be mindful of that, putting him into your army, that if you're going to make uh, that initial early game power move to grab Lu Bu, you have a plan in place to increase... Uh, your income to actually field him. I mean, look at this. At this rate, I can field him in seven turns. Well, six actually. If I don't spend any money, and at that part, at that point, I'm going to be like hamstrung or hamstringing my own growth. So, you take Lu Bu. Have a plan in mind. But again, guys, this should hopefully help you out with Liu Biao. And if you have any questions on Liu Biao, uh, feel free to let me know in the comments below. I can definitely help you out as best I can. Um, he's probably the warlord I have the least experience with, but I did a lot of. Um, kind of crash testing on certain things in this campaign to see how expansion works with him and what directions maybe make the most sense. But let's move on to our last warlord on this list.
Ma Tung is our last warlord, and arguably I would say the most militant of our warlord. I'm sorry, of our governors. Now his uh, specialization is on foraging and supplies. Armies forge food when encamped, which is a really nice ability in that he can gain military supplies and um, I think it's replenishment in enemy territory. We'll take a look at the tooltip. Um, increases military supplies bonus as his uh, special uh, Zhi Liang uh, supply lines. And his playstyle focus is on cavalry and military supplies. And honestly, his cav is so strong. Chiang hunters, Chiang marauders, and then Chiang raiders. Now, these guys all have fatigue to immunity. Or, I'm sorry, immunity to fatigue. <laughs> which, as you've seen in the game, if you've played so far, is, is so incredibly strong. Because your cavalry can get fatigued so quickly. And this fatigue immunity allows them to really rove around the battlefield the entire time, lopping off heads left and right. It's it's so, so strong. Let's take a look at Matang here. We'll do our standard edition moves. Do this, I'll delegate that. And again, guys, please don't delegate these if um, you're not in an advantageous situation. Only time I would delegate is if I just beat an army and they had like remnants of their army left. And even then, I'd probably still pursue them. Um, you can see... As a result of delegating, okay, sometimes you'll lose a lot of health on characters that you otherwise would not have. Um, and honestly, I'll, I'll probably... I won't go delegate this battle, because I would actually fight this battle. There's more here than uh, than me. So, even though these guys have fatigue immunity and they can do some good damage on charge, um, this, is a, this is a fight I would actually like to get into in person and fight. And we're not going to do that for the intent of this video. Uh, but what we are going to talk about is how to expand and how to play Ma Tung. So taking a look at Wu Du, uh, the first thing of first order of business would be taking the town of Wu Du, uh, which you can do on turn one. Um, he does have his special building line, Jia Ling Supply Lines. And this gives him some good public order. Food production, which is nice as you see, he doesn't start with any livestock farms, any grain, anything like that to begin with. So this is a really great way to get food production early with Ma Tung because he does have a food issue. Uh, and then a nice bonus to military supplies and then a, a, um, a reduction to military supplies for enemies in his territory, which is good. Um, let's take a look at this special thing for him. So Foraging Forces is his special encampment, which gives him food production and allows him to recruit and replenish in um, his own territory, at least. But the big thing is that it gives him food production. He'll he'll give food for his uh, his army. And he will also uh, get military supplies. Even in enemy territory, which is important here. So if you have Ma Tung not engaged in an engagement or in a campaign, you can just pop him in your own territory and forage if you want. So it's nice to kind of have that as a, as a stance that you can choose from. Now, when you take a look at Ma Tung's location, it's not the best. Your first order of business should be... Let me actually set these off should be shutting down Gongdu. Gongdu can get... It doesn't look like he can get strong, but if you've watched mine, uh, my campaign, you can see how we took Wudu, and then we had trouble actually hitting Gongdu and taking him out, but he managed to just kind of squeak past us, push north, and put Huan Sui to the sword for the most part, and then expanded all throughout this portion of the Han Empire. And that is not the focus you want. You want to put down Gongdu as fast as you can. You're going to deal with issues from Zheng Lu, but my recommendation with Zheng Lu would be to just keep him at bay, uh, keep a good positive relationship with him through diplomacy, do whatever you can, and do not get pulled into the wars and conflicts of Dong Zhuo. Um, you do start with a good positive relationship with him, but let him fight his own fights. If you get pulled into those wars, you'll get stuck into a lot of wars with people that are going to outpower you very fast. Yeah, outpower, over, overpower you very fast. So, you're obviously your focus is going to be on cavalry. And with cavalry, I would say your primary focus is going to be on horse pastures. So, let's take a look at horse pastures. Um, from the start, they're pretty great, right? Minus 5% recruitment and upkeep for cav units. Now, at the top end, that increases to 20%. You do need the reform barbed mounts. Take a look at that. At the very end of this red portion of the red tree. That is going to get you an additional 8% recruitment cost reduction for cab units. And this is strong because uh, I can't show you on this. or we'll, we'll end this turn to, just so I can show you. But 
the recruitment cost for his unique cav units is substantial. I think it's like 3400 right out the gate. So getting that reduced as fast as possible is going to be key. Let's take a look here. Oh, um, pop right back there. Now I'll press recruit. Yeah, uh, there we go. Chung Hunters is 2800 That's just wild. 3200 for Chung Marauders. So getting that reduced as fast as possible is going to be key. Your, your Chung Raiders are the very last one here. They, they I think, are 3400 to recruit. So how do you do that? Well, there are four horse pastures in the game. Um, some resources are very limited. Like, for instance, we talked about the Jade Mine earlier. There's only one, what, like right there and right there? Whatever the second one is, like, oh, right there or something like that. But there's only two Jade Mines in the entire game. So, horse pastures, with there only being four, I will tell you all four locations now. You've got one right here. You start with one of them, which is very advantageous. The second one is right here in uh, Wu Wei. If I click hit it, yeah. You can see that this is the, uh, it's abandoned right now, so no one even owns it. So you need this horse pasture, and then your last horse pasture is right here, I believe. Look at the map here. No, right here, right here. So this location in uh, Shuofang, this location in Wu Wei, and then this location, which we already have um, over here in Jiangyang, or uh, Jincheng. The last horse pasture is over here in Dai. Uh, if you want to blitz for it, that's great. That would mean that your recruitment cost and your upkeep cost would be zero for your cab. But, oh, where's Dai? There's Dai. Um, but it's really hard to get to. You have to deal with quite a lot going through these mountains or over the over through the uh, Yangtze River, whatever you want to do. That's not the Yangtze River. My bad. But still, my point remains is getting to the Dai Commandery to take it from Gongsun Zan is going to be way more difficult than it is. Just get the 20... Uh, 40, and then 60, uh, 2, 4, 6, yeah, 60% that you'll get from these three alone. Uh, when you get this one, it'll get you out to 80, and then you've got other bonuses that'll put you at 100% pretty much. Um, you do also get an Animal Tamer right here, which is pretty nice. Um, the Commandery for this, for Shofang, is all right there, so this is all abandoned, I believe. It's not actually um, uh, controlled by Han Empire, so taking it is even easier. But that would be your, my primary recommendation. My primary goal here would be, so to recap, go take Gongdu. That should be number one. Mash out Gongdu, take that copper mine. You'll get a lot of good commerce trade from that copper mine. But silk is also in abundance in this portion of the map. I think there's only um, like four or five silk in the entire game. Um, there's, there's three. Uh, silk resources, and two of them are right there. And the third one is right there. So, this brings me to my next point. After you take Gongdu, and then you take over this portion of Wu Wei, and then uh, Shoufang, smash out Han Sui. Han Sui, yes, I know, he's your bro, he's your ally, that's great. But, by keeping him as an ally, and keeping it so that you're taking out any opposition up here, you're pretty much ensuring that this silk trader stays free for you to capture. Because once you take these locations, and then take Han Sui, there is, you can see there's no northern enemies. All of your enemies will be to the southeast for the most part. And your southern border will be pretty much um, already previously conquered and maintained. So, that leaves a natural progression for your reform tree as well. You can focus then, thusly, on your silk trade. I believe it was a blue, I, I can't remember now off the top of my head. Oh, uh, where are you? Yes, no, maybe so. Look at me, not knowing what I'm talking about, but still. Um, you can then focus on your silk reforms, which are going to be huge, because you will have the only two of three silk traders on the entire game. And then from there, you can expand outward and take, you get a, yeah, you can get a, a silk expedition trading port if you cement a trading port, which you start very close to. So you need the silk resource and a trading port, and you can create this, which gives you a 40% income from silk bonus. So you have a lot of ways to stack your, your uh, income from Silk and from that trading port, which is not too far from your starting location. I wish I could show you guys the Silk building. Uh, uh, uh. Well, still, nonetheless, my point remains, well, you know, hey, you want to know a really fast way to check it? You do this, you right click that, you click this building and you click that. <laughs> 
And there's our silk buildings. So here you go. Get all your uh, your Grand Silk Road market. Get you a massive income from silk and then a massive increase percentage-wise from silk. So you'll be getting these two territories, these silk resources, and then eventually this third one, once you decide to kind of push into Dong Zhuo's territory after he's kind of dissolved a bit. And you can even try and push for this port in... Um, what is this? Is it funding? No, this is Hedong. So, as you expand, you can push towards that region. So, again, real quick recap. Gongdu, take up these two uh, commanderies, then push down to Huansui, and then just, I would say, fill out this area and push further south and southeast as you see fit with Ma Tung. Ma Tung, I think, of the three of these governors, has a pretty straightforward progression. Once you do these, these initial steps, you have then solidified yourself. You can be a very disgustingly strong military force because you, of course, have your family tree with uh, Macau, and Macau is so strong. He is so, so, so awesome. So do that, cement those locations, and you will have a much easier playthrough with uh, Ma Tung. If you don't do that to begin with, you'll be just dealing with a lot of issues. Again, shore up your issues with, with Zheng Lu. Don't get pulled into any errant wars. Forge your own destiny. Don't follow the, uh, the the story that wants you to push into one direction. Just do what I said and you'll have an easier time. The story really throws you into the fire hard and fast. And if you want to do that, please, by all means, do it. But again, just be mindful of the direction you're taking with uh, Ma Tung because it can get very dicey very quickly here with him. I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything in that uh, faction summary window. But um, again, he does have issues with food, so you can trade with uh, with Juan Sui for food and other fac factions. There's a lot of factions right here that you can trade, so be mindful of those things as well because you will not have access to a lot of food until you expand to these northern regions that have, like, you know, your livestock farm and the such. But hopefully this gives you a better idea and an easier approach on how to play Ma Tung in the campaign. Well, that kind of sums things up with our three governor warlords. You can see that they do have a very different play style from the coalition warlords, which are more war focused. Um, and the, the whole tyrant warlord in Dong Zhuo is focused at enemies at the gates. And Yellow Turbans has a different focus as well. Same thing with the outlaws. But the governors, I feel, have so many cards stacked against them. And you have a lot of things that you can do to really take advantage of and exploit as the governors. But again, a lot of detractors that are always working against you as the governors. For instance, Ma Tung has a constant reduction to his public order. So reducing the tax in, say, that initial horse pasture will give you a lot of benefits early on because you won't have to deal with so many public order issues on anything you don't control as a single commandery. Uh, Liu Biao starts in a very difficult landlocked position, so you have to expand very carefully and cleverly. Uh, Kong Rong starts with his back up against the wall in a very advantageous position, but if you don't expand quickly, you will lose out and be completely surrounded and landlocked even further. Hopefully these gave you guys a really good amount of tips on how to start each one of these warlords, and as you progress through your own campaign, I hope to hear some of your own successes or your failures and how these tips either didn't or did help you. But as always guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.